a continuación tenemos con nosotros a John Moravec. Eh, John es de la Universidad de... ¿Está John? Sí. Está aquí. Ah, pasa John. John viene de la Universidad de Minnesota y me gustaría que él nos presente también. Yo prefiero que él nos dé una pequeña introducción y después entrar a su video. Y así Sandra, a los que necesitamos el audio, nos ayude. John. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. I don't know you. Do you guys hear me? <laughs> yes, we do. Fantastic. 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 I'm interested in the future. I'm interested in the future and how we're going to get there. Oh. I'm interested in what we're going to be doing and what it's going to take for us to become successful there. So I'm going to explore three questions here. I'm going to ask, what is the nature of, of the future of society and of the future of work? How can our education systems fit in for this? And how can we train kids for jobs that we do not know that would exist yet? And what are the best pathways for exploring this future? And I'm also going to use these next few minutes to provide a framework for looking at the recent history and the near future of society. I put this in a framework which I call Society 1.0 to 3.0. It's kind of tacky, and I apologize for that, but it kind of works as a language. And I'm going to also discuss how our education systems fit in and call for what we need to do next. Next there. All right, so let's start with society 1.0, as I call it. This is the industrial and information society. This is the society that most of us um, woke, that most of us grew up in. This is where white collar work emerged, that the middle class expanded, and we started using our resources to interpret data. And all of this also was born the information society. And we organized things as much as we could. We organized it into hierarchies. Um, in classrooms, for example, you know, people, all the students are stand, sitting in rows as we are coming here today, and, this, and the teacher in, in the front, and there's a, very, there's a hierarchical order. People had bosses. It's very easy to tell who the boss was, who the boss reported, and, and the relationships were very easy to understand. And our jobs and the roles we had were, very, were siloed. We were very distinct from one another. A banker was only a banker. An architect is only an architect. And that's just how things worked. It was very easy to understand. And we did everything that we could to avoid chaos and ambiguity. And at the mothership, Ted, uh, Ken Robinson, I think, made it, made it very clear that our education system is really geared towards producing kids that can function in the society in an industrial and information society. Now let's look at what's happening, though. I call it, what's happening is what I call, we're we've been transitioning into society 2.0. This is where we interpret information, and we use it to create knowledge in the knowledge society. And knowledge consists of two things, for personal knowledge, a tacit component and an explicit component. An explicit component is like something you can read in a book and learn and then you acquire that knowledge. Tacit knowledge is learning by doing, like riding a bicycle. I can, I can write a book about riding a bicycle, but when it teach you how to ride a bicycle, you actually have to go out and do it. Now, when we mix these two things together, we get personal knowledge. That makes us unique as individuals, and, what's, and, and our personal knowledge is what gets us, gets us, uh, makes us competitive within the knowledge society. Now, we also get together. We get together at conferences, we get together at work, we get together at, at bars, wherever, and we create social knowledge. When my knowledge mixes in with, say, Ernesto's knowledge, we create some sorts of meta-knowledge. And a whole field of knowledge management emerged to kind of manage this, the chaos and ambiguity that's, that stems in these environments. Another interesting facet of this is that um, as we discussed earlier, that there's a horizontalization or horizon horizontal revolution taking place, uh, primarily through Web 2.0 technologies. So we have, a, we have YouTubes, we have blogs, wikis, and hip-hop that allow us to cut and paste new meanings to create something new. And we have technologies that allow us to participate in new ways. For example, if you want to be a scientist, you can do it. You can do it at home. You could search for extraterrestrial life at the SETI at Home Project. You could search for a cure for cancer using the Folding at Home Project. The Autobahn Society encourages us to, to, um, 
to, to count the types and numbers of birds we see in our backyards and report them back. And they get, they get a statistically accurate sample of the bird populations in any place on the planet. However, I'm a futurist, and this is what's really starting to emerge now, is that we have an innovation society, that, that the real leaders are taking the knowledge that's out there, and they're contextualizing it in new ways. And knowledge is becoming horizontally diffused. Relationships are no longer hierarchical, but rather heterarchical. Uh, say, some people say that the world is flattening, as are relationships. It's hard to tell who one person's boss is anymore. Uh, my, myself, I seem to have dotted line relationships with about uh, 50,000 bosses I mean, at the University of Minnesota. And I think that the real leaders are showing that we're really embracing chaos and ambiguity for what it is and attending to it rather than avoiding it. But there's more. That this, this innovation society is focusing more and more on individuals. And this places an increased importance on creativity and on entrepreneurship among individuals. We're also seeing that knowledge and innovation workers are, high, are highly mobile, and they're valued for the knowledge individual contributions. And that, that these individuals are no longer particularly loyal to companies for any given periods of time. Likewise, in the modern economy, companies are no longer loyal to individuals throughout their lifetimes. So we hop around from jobs to jobs, from ideas to ideas, from different roles to roles. And so I call these people who are knowledge workers, who are mobile, that move around nomads. A nomad, I'm going to read about my, what my definition is here. A nomad is my term, a nomadic knowledge worker that is imaginative, creative, and an innovative person who can work with almost anyone, anytime, and anywhere. They instantly reconfigure and recontextualize their work environments, and greater mobility is creating new opportunities. So for nomads, we forget about these silos from the industrial paradigm. We work beyond them. Nomads create their own silos and their own roles, and they're post-disciplinary. That means that they're unique knowledge experts at the individual level. So what? This is a huge paradigm shift within their own lifetimes. So we're moving from fundamental relationships that used to be very simple and easy to understand to something that's very complex, requires creativity, and the system seems to be very goal-oriented in itself. Our conceptualizations of order are no longer hierarchic, but they're intentional, and they're heterarchic. Relationships of parts are mechanical, no longer mechanical, but they're now synergetic. Our worldview is no longer de deterministic. I can't tell you what my future is. It used to be very easy to tell you what I would be doing five years from now. But now I'm asked to design my own future. We are all asked to design our own futures. Causality used to be very linear. It used to be very easy to tell that A caused B, which caused C. Now it's anti-causal. That means change is happening so fast, the world's becoming much more complex, that it looks like that C is causing A, which is causing G, which is causing B sometimes, and that this linearity is becoming lost. And the place that this is happening is no longer local, but is rather globalized. And that we can all transverse amongst this global plane. So what does this mean for education? And I think this is what's remarkable. Very simply put, 1.0 schools cannot teach 3.0 kids. Okay, this is troubling. Our schools are still stuck in the industrial 1.0 paradigm but the rest of the world is trending towards 3.0. So to build nomads, 1.0 schools simply cannot teach 3.0 kids. So nomadic 3.0 kids, Whoa. they remix, recontextualize, and transform ideas into action. They learn how to think rather than what to think. How many of us in this room have had a course on how to think? I don't think very many. We've had courses on what to think has been very direct because we're designed to, make, to become very great factory workers. Nomads play, imagine, and create innovative futures. They dream big 
and design their own futures. They're connected and they're interconnected virtually and interpersonally. They're fearless at what they do, but they're also responsible to themselves and to others and to, the, to greater society. And they're global citizens that can mobilize. An education nomad society must support all of these attributes. So to help us get there, this is what I think we need to do. We need to leapfrog beyond all the things that have been holding us in the past. We have to identify our futures and create them today. We are charged with redesigning education. And this is a noble quest to leapfrog beyond all the, beyond all the hurdles that prevent us from getting to the 3.0 paradigm in education. We must dream big, we must innovate, we have to play, we have to remix, we have to take responsibility, mobilize ourselves, be fearless, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all nomad qualities. And we owe it to emerging nomad generation to leapfrog beyond the limits of society 1.0. And to lead, we have to create new traditions so we can leapfrog towards those. So in society 3.0, we're all co-educators and co-learners, and we're all responsible for leading this transformation, and we have to do this together. So thank you. <laughs>